Hello, my name is Sean McLaughlin. I'm the director of the Bazillion Spirituality Center, and this is a talk on three women saints. The talk is on Macarena the Younger, Catherine of Siena, and Teresa of Avila. Okay, let's begin with an overview. I'll talk about what a saint is and a little bit about these three saints. I'll give a timeline and a map to situate them chronologically and geographically. I'll make some notes about the sources for their lives, and then we'll talk about the fact that two of the three are doctors of the church and what that means. Lastly, for the overview, I'll emphasize what I hope that you remember from the talk, and I'll outline the methodology that we will use to examine each saint in the main part of the presentation. Okay, so to begin with, what's a saint? A saint is a member of the communion of saints. The communion of saints is mentioned, for example, in the Apostles' Creed. It is the spiritual solidarity which binds together the faithful on earth, the souls in purgatory, and the saints in heaven, in the organic unity of the same mystical body under Christ its head. A simple definition of a saint is someone whom the church has formally declared to be united with God in heaven, an intercessory to God on behalf of the living, and worthy of public and universal veneration. Saints are people who achieved tremendous holiness in life despite their sin and human limitations, whom the church identifies as role models for Christian life. So by no means are they perfect, but they were persistent in their prayer uh, and their uh, desire to serve God and the church. Think of saints as older brothers and sisters in Christ who have gone before us, whom we can look up to as well as learn from. Saints are Christ-centered and guide us to Christ through their writings, example, and intercession. Okay, so who are these three saints? First, we have Macrina the Younger. She was born about 327, died about 379. She lived during a transitional period in late antiquity. She is co-founder of the Order of St. Basil the Great, along with Basil. And she profoundly influenced her mother, St. Amelia, and younger brothers, St. Basil and St. Gregory of Nyssa. Catherine of Siena. She was born 1347, died 1380. She lived during a tumultuous period for the papacy in the late Middle Ages. She was a mystic and is a doctor of the church, and she experienced the stigmata. Teresa of Avila, she was born 1515, died 1582. She lived during the 16th century, an extremely important century that includes the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. She was a mystic and is a doctor of the church, and her writings on prayer are supremely important for the church. To situate these three saints chronologically, let's take a look at historiographical periods. So historians use historiographical periods to break up history into manageable bites. So if we begin uh, from the left, around the time of the birth of Christ, we see Christian antiquity. Then late antiquity, then the Middle Ages, early modernity, modernity, and finally, post-modernity. So different scholars will quibble over exact dates when these periods begin and end, but this gives you a general sense of when, um, of where they fall, when and where they fall. Macrina was born in the beginning of late antiquity, Catherine towards the end of the Middle Ages, and Teresa in early modernity. Okay, so there's, uh, gives you a sense of chronology. Now let's look at geography. Let's begin in the east, towards on the right of the screen. There we see Macrina is from what is now northern Turkey, close to the Black Sea coast, but what was then the Pontus region of Asia Minor. Then Catherine, from what is now northern Italy, what was then the Republic of Siena. And finally, Teresa, from Avila, a little bit west of Madrid. 
So there's a wide geographic spread here from the Iberian coast through Italy all the way to uh, the northern coast of Turkey. <clears throat> Some notes about sources for saints' lives. There are sources written about saints and those written by them. Most sources written about saints belong to the literary genre known as hagiography, which means holy writing. Peterson defines hagiography as a class of writing about holy men and women. Hagiographies typically contain historical information, but do not limit themselves to journalistic objectivity. The authors are not trying to deceive or mislead the reader, they are merely following the conventions of the genre. And authors of the genre intend to paint the portrait of a holy person for the edification of the reader. Their goal is to build faith, and sometimes they will go to great lengths to do this. Sources for Catherine and Teresa are numerous. They include their own writings, as well as contemporary accounts. In contrast, all we have from Macrina is Gregory of Nyssa's description of her life. Okay, regarding doctors of the church. The title originates during the medieval period and was first applied to Ambrose, Augustine, Gregory the Great, and Jerome. Today, there are about, there are 36 doctors of the church. And I like how Father Larry Rice puts it. He says, these saints are probably best thought of as doctors in the PhD sense of the word. Through their research, study, and writing, they have advanced the church's knowledge of our faith. Okay, and I emphasize writing because we're gonna be looking in particular at the writing of Catherine, the writings of Catherine and Teresa, because they exhibit brilliance and mystical insight. Here is a slide showing all 36 doctors of the church. It's in chronological order. So if you go to the rightmost column, you can see Catherine of Siena and Teresa. And in the leftmost column, you can see Basil the Great, who was Macrina's brother, and then Gregory of Nazianzus, who was a close friend of the families. So all three women saints are either represented here or have family connection. All right, now here's what I hope that you remember. For Macrina, think fourth century Asia Minor, co-founder of the order of St. Basil the Great along with her brother and innovator in monastic life. For Catherine, 14th century Italy, Dominican tertiary, in other words, she was a third order laywoman. She helped restore the papacy to Rome after it was at Avignon. And Teresa, 16th century Spain, Carmelite nun and reformer of the order, brilliant writer on spirituality. Okay, <clears throat> finally, the method we're going to use for examining each saint will begin with a quick overview, followed by some historical context and geographical context. I'll give additional biographical information, then we'll look at an excerpt from the saint's writing, and finally, a quick look at the religious order with which the saint is affiliated, because each of these three saints is affiliated with a religious order. Okay, let's begin with Macrina. Macrina the Younger. This icon is held at Holy Trinity Chapel in Fox Chase. It is the uh, home chapel for the Jesus Lover of Humanity province of the Sisters of St. Basil. Macrina was a monastic foundress from Pontus, in Asia Minor. And the source for her life, which is Gregory's life of Macrina, is historically notable for being a record of life among women in the fourth century church and an account of early monasticism. So it's a unique historical, social, and spiritual document. It is written in the form of a family chronicle by someone who was an eyewitness of many of the events that it described and who was actuated by motives of family affection and a desire to honor the dead. And that someone, of course, is one of her younger brothers, Gregory of Nyssa. Okay, let's look at some historical context for fourth century Asia Minor. Asia Minor is part of the cradle of Catholicism and is so important to the faith that it has been called the other Holy Land. Macrina the Elder, Macrina the Younger's grandmother, was persecuted for being a Christian. However, the relationship between the church and the Roman Empire was quickly evolving. So we see, for example, not long before Macrina the Younger is born, in 313, Christianity is legalized. 
Then right around the time she died in 380, the Roman Empire officially adopts Christianity as uh, the state religion. So in between, Christianity is legal, but it is not the official religion of the empire. Also in fourth century Asia Minor, monasticism is becoming more established, particularly Cenobitism, in contrast to earlier ascetics who lived as hermits. So Cenobites are ascetics or monastics who live in community, um, and whereas hermits live off by themselves. Macrina was really remarkable for transforming the family estate into a monastery where she lived as an equal with former servants and slaves. Um, and this is difficult for us to realize what a revolutionary development it was for educated women and girls, that is Amelia and Macrina, to undertake manual labor. Cooking and housework were looked upon as tasks fit only for slaves. So this is why Macrina was a monastic innovator. And she came from an exceptional family. I mentioned before, her grandmother, Macrina the Elder, was persecuted by the Roman Empire for being a Christian. She is a saint. Um, Macrina's parents, Basil the Elder and Amelia, are also saints. And uh, five of the nine siblings are saints. So the, there were nine children, five sisters, and four brothers. And the five who are saints are Macrina, Basil, Gregory of Nyssa, Peter of Sebast, and Nocratius. So it's a saintly, devout family, extremely important for the history of the church. Here are four of the eight saints from the family of Macrina and Basil. Beginning on the left, we have Basil and Macrina. In the middle, we have the Theotokos, the Blessed Mother. And then on the right, we have Macrina the Elder, their grandmother, and then their brother, Gregory of Nyssa. In the middle, also uh, in front of the Blessed Mother, is the Pillar of Fire. That is the symbol of the Order of St. Basil with the laurel and oak wreaths as well. This, is, this painting is at the Brazilian Spirituality Center. Okay. <clears throat> Here is where uh, the town or the, the village where Macrina lived was called Anissa. Again, it was in the Pontus region of Asia Minor, which is today Northern Turkey. You can see it's very close to the Black Sea. And the, the region is uh, mountainous, kind of rugged. It's known for its harsh winters, but um, beautiful and green um, when the, when, during the year when it's a little warmer or much warmer. So here are the Pontic Mountains, the mountains of the Pontus region. Okay, a little more about Macrina the Younger. She was the eldest of nine children, including, as I said, St. Basil and St. Gregory of Nyssa. Her parents are saints as well, Basil the Elder and Amelia. She was a capable woman of strong character who, though clearly a person of intellectual ability, was willing to per perform lowly household tasks and was devout, loving, patient, and humble. So for example, Basil, her brother, compares her to a strong tower, a shield, and a strong city. And the fresco on the left, this is in St. Sophia's Cathedral and Cave. Macrina prayed the Psalter all the time and was engaged, but her fiancé died. Afterwards, she would not consider marriage. She was extremely close with her mother, Amelia, who used to tell a joke that she carried her other eight children for the normal period of time, nine months, and gave birth to them, but it was as though she never quite gave birth to Macrina because Macrina was always with her mother. It, it, she was very devoted to her. We know from Gregory of Nyssa's account that Macrina would bake the bread that would be consecrated at the Divine Liturgy or Mass. And uh, after her mother was widowed, later on she convinced her to turn the home into a monastery. And that was one thing, because they were wealthy, and wealth was hard to come by at that time in that part of the world. So to convert their estate or villa into a monastery was big. But what was even more incredible was that they treated the maids and slave women as sisters and equals. And Macrina, with this aristocratic background, was doing manual labor, and that was just unthinkable. So Macrina made the suggestion, Amelia followed, and um, placed herself on equal footing with the whole group of virgins living there. Okay, so they, seemed, they shared equality at the same table, shared the same kind of bed, all the same necessities of life. And Macrina had a tremendous reputation for holiness 
uh, during her mortal life so that when she died, her death was felt throughout the region. Gregory tells us that at daybreak, the crowd of both men and women who had flocked together from the surrounding district disturbed the chanting of the Psalms with their groaning. Okay, Macrina was known as a miracle worker even while she was still alive. She herself had a tumor in her breast, possibly cancer. It's difficult to tell from the account, but she was miraculously healed after praying all night in the sanctuary, lying prostrate, treating it with mud made from her tears and asking Amelia to make the sign of the cross over it. Gregory, Gregory learned from the father of a baby girl that Macrina had healed his daughter's eye disease. The father was a man of high military rank who was in command of the garrison in a small town in Pontus called Sebastopolis, and he was living there with his troops. Gregory notes, his voice was choked by his sobs and his tears poured down while he described what had happened. This is what I learned from the soldier. Gregory says in his life of Macrina, there are still other miracle stories, such as the cures of illnesses, the casting out of devils, and the prophecies of the future, which came true. But he's reluctant to share them because he doesn't think that the reader will believe them. So, as I said, the only source for Macrina's life, contemporary source, is Gregory of Nyssa's Life of Macrina. And it's broken down into five parts. There's the prologue. Uh, the life of Macrina, the main biography of her. Then there's this account of Gregory's visit to her during her last days and then when she died. And the fourth part, that's where we get the accounts of her miracles. And then finally, the fifth part is uh, the epilogue. But it's from this middle part, uh, Gregory's visit to Macrina, that we get Macrina's prayer. So this is a prayer Gregory attributes to Macrina. It's a beautiful prayer. And this is just a brief excerpt. I won't read the whole thing, but just the first point. It is you, O Lord, who have freed us from the fear of death. You have made our life here the beginning of our true life. You grant our bodies to rest in sleep for a season, and you rouse our bodies again at the last trumpet. So it's this beautiful um, prayer alluding to the salvific act of Christ's life, death, and resurrection that allows us to live with God forever. Okay, and lastly for Macrina, she is a co-founder of the Order of St. Basil the Great, also known as the Basilians. She and Basil founded them. If you ever meet a Basilian, you'll notice that at the end of their name, they have OSBM, which is a Latin abbreviation for Order of St. Basil the Great. They're monastics, but they are active. So they're not cloistered like the Carmelites are historically. And education is the main ministry of the Sisters of St. Basil. So for example, here in Fox Chase, we have St. Basil Academy and Manor College. And that is the, the logo or the seal of the Sisters of St. Basil the Great. You can see that flaming pillar, just like in the painting, uh, the ar laurel and oak uh, wreaths and the globe, and then at the top, the sun representing Christ. Okay, moving on to Catherine of Siena. Catherine of Siena lived mostly in Siena throughout her life, but also a little bit in Rome. She was a mystic who experienced the stigmata. And you can see here uh, the wound of Christ on her hand. <clears throat> her writings include the dialogue as well as various letters and prayers. And her intellectual contributions to the church are, are put this way. What is original in Catherine is her capacity for fresh and vivid expression of the tradition. That is uh, such an important feature of the saints. It's one I also see in Basil, um, because in um, expounding upon the sacred deposit of faith, it's very difficult to be creative yet um, orthodox, to bring new life to it, yet to not deviate from tradition. A lot of people have gone wrong doing that over the centuries, but Catherine is always reliable in her uh, thought and writings. Okay, some historical context about 14th century Italy. For this, I'm indebted to Bishop Robert Barron's ministry, Word on Fire. They do an incredible job, especially with the saints. Um, and there is a, a PDF outline of her life that I'm taking this from. So I really encourage you to check out Word on Fire. Uh, it's one of the best things on the internet. 
Okay, so the time span of Catherine's life was marked by enormous change and upheaval, both within the church and in society in general. An old world was disappearing fast, the world of the Middle Ages, and what the future might bring was by no means clear. Catherine's contemporaries witnessed the damage caused by wars and by countless natural disasters, but witnessed also the truly terrifying horror of the Black Death, the bubonic plague. The plague succeeded in decimating almost two thirds of Europe's population. At the same time, a different kind of plague was at work within the church, a plague of unbelievable corruption. Catherine felt constrained as a result to acknowledge that the church she loved so deeply had become a garden overgrown with putrid flowers, a bride whose face is disfigured with leprosy. Something else um, to keep in mind is that Italy, as we know it, did not exist until the mid-19th century. It was not a unified country. Previously, it consisted of various states and political entities constantly vying for power and influence. So, for example, Catherine was from the Republic of Siena, which was not the same as Sicily or Naples. Um, so it was a very complicated political scene. And unfortunately, the Vatican, uh, well, the papacy was often pulled into these um, political struggles. Other major events to keep in mind during that time, the Black Death, which I mentioned, that was about 1350. Florence and the papacy were briefly at war in the 1370s. For the first three quartiles of the 14th century, the papacy was not at Rome, but at Avignon in France. And then uh, right around the turn of the 15th century, a little before, a little after, we have the papal schism between Rome, Avignon, and Pisa, another disastrous period for the Pope, the Popes. <clears throat> okay, so here's where Siena is on, in, the, in Italy, northern Italy today. Here you get a sense of the the town, it's a medieval town, so it doesn't, it's not laid out in a grid. A little more about Catherine. She was the 24th of 25 children and was strikingly pleasant and outgoing as a child. The stubborn independence that was to be a hallmark of most of her life showed itself early, as well as the intense emotional struggle she knew when faced with more pleasant alternatives to the austere way she felt herself called to follow. So this is one of the many reasons why Catherine of Siena is so relatable, because on the one hand, she felt called to live a, really, a life really strictly conforming to the gospel, and that involved austerities. But that wasn't easy for her. She had this intense emotional, emotional struggle to you know, live a more pleasant or comfortable life. So um, it just goes to show you that the saints have their struggles, and that's what makes them more relatable. Even though she was uneducated, she was a tireless conversationalist. Um, and her family wanted her to get married, but she did not want to do that. She fought with them over that. And eventually she joined the Mantellate when she was 18. They were a group of women affiliated with the Dominicans who worked serving the needs of the poor and the sick. And Catherine sought out the lost in Siena. As her fame for holiness increased, Catherine found herself drawn into some of the most pressing affairs of the church and also into the murky drama of Italian politics. So she was active on the world stage. And we see this, for example, when she convinced Gregory XI to leave uh, Avignon for Rome. But what's amazing about Catherine is she wasn't just concerned with these um, high, po high, po with high politics. You know, she really was committed to the lost uh, and the marginalized uh, in Siena, you know, with, with um, those who, in whom she saw Christ. So here's the papal palace in Avignon. Still there today. And a little more about Catherine. So she was a, a young laywoman without an official role or title within the church. And yet she did not hesitate to write or dictate letters to all kinds of people. Cardinals, monks, family members, nuns, hermits, widows, priests, a mercenary soldier, a king, a tyrant, a queen, a prostitute, a lawyer, a poet, and, amazing to recall, two Roman pontiffs, Gregory XI and Urban VI. And again, that's from the Word on Fire uh, PDF. She's the only laywoman ever proclaimed a doctor of the church. So, for example, uh, Teresa of Avila, she's a Carmelite. Teresa of Lisieux, she is also a religious. So, um, 
she's remarkable because she was technically uneducated and a, and a laywoman, yet she is a doctor of the church. This is, Catherine, this is I'm saying of Catherine of Siena. During her life, she had all kinds of mystical experiences, but some major events would be uh, her mystical espousal to Christ in 1368, the mystical death she experienced in 1370, and the, stigma, uh, the stigmata which came in 1375. So Catherine of Siena's holiness is rooted not in her, this is an important thing to consider, that despite these amazing and unusual, i.e. mystical experiences, her holiness is not rooted in that, but in her simple commitment to discerning and following God's will a model that never goes out of style. This is a quote by uh, Sister Suzanne Nofke, um, who was a Dominican nun, God rest her soul, who recently died. She was an expert on Catherine. And I think this is really important because, yes, she had these mystical experiences. Yes, she was involved with uh, events on the world stage. But um, the root of her holiness is in her simple holiness and in her love of the poor and the lost. Here is a depiction by Giovanni de Paolo uh, of Catherine's mystical marriage to Christ. This is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. You can see her dressed in the Dominican habit there. And one of the most incredible, um, I think, points of mysticism for both Catherine and Teresa are their visions of hell. So Catherine of Siena saw a vision of hell and this is God speaking to her. God said, my daughter, the tongue is not sufficient to narrate the pain of these poor souls, as there are three principal vices, with injustice and cruelty and with other filthiness and iniquitous sins that follow upon these. So the three principal vices are self-love, love of reputation, and pride. And God goes on to tell her that there are four principal torments in hell out of which proceed all the other torments. So the four principal torments of hell that Catherine saw in her vision of hell or was told about would be the deprivation of the beatific vision. The beatific vision is what we all strive to have for eternity, beholding God in God's fullness, the Trinity, knowing God, knowing the Trinity in, in, in God's fullness. The worm of conscience, which gnaws unceasingly. Eternal vision of the devil, which is the opposite of the beatific vision. And the fourth torment that God describes is fire. This fire burns and does not consume. For the being of the soul cannot be consumed because it is not a material thing that fire can consume. But I, by divine justice, have permitted the fire to burn them with torments so that it torments them without consuming them with the greatest pains in diverse ways according to the diversity of their sins, to some more and to some less according to the gravity of their fall. Okay, so terrifying vision of hell that Catherine had. But on the other hand, and at the same time, Catherine knew God's mercy, and she, you know, has handed this down to us. So Catherine writes, even if all the sins that could possibly be committed were gathered together in one person, it would be like a drop of vinegar in the sea of God's mercy. So I think that's a, a beautiful, um, there's a beautiful tension between the reality of sin and hell, and also the unfathomable depth of God's loving mercy. Okay, so Catherine's body is at, uh, in uh, the Dominican church of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva in Rome, but her head is held at the Basilica of St. Dominic in Siena. So right there in the middle of that altar, side altar, if you look, there is Catherine of Siena's head on display. Okay, now the most important writing by Catherine is the dialogue. Um, and Sister Nofke calls this the, her bequest of all her teaching to her followers. It's a literal dialogue between a soul that's sort of a stand-in for Catherine and God. Um, and the book involved a great deal of dictation on her part while she was in ecstasy. One of the things she says, she calls the Trinity fire and abyss of love. I think that's a beautiful, um, a beautiful way to think of the Trinity as an abyss of love and also using the, the image of fire. So Catherine also wrote that God is mad with love for each one of us. So all these are part of the dialogue, which is the main writing by St. Catherine of Siena. Okay, lastly for Catherine, she is affiliated with the Dominicans, whose formal name is the Order of Preachers. They were founded in 1216 by St. Dominic. If you meet a Dominican uh, brother, priest, or sister, 
you'll see at the end of their names is OP, which is the Latin abbreviation for order of preachers. Now they're mendicants, so they're very active. They're not cloistered and they're especially focused on preaching. And Catherine was a tertiary or third order Dominican. So technically she was a lay woman, but um, the third order still very much uh, work closely with the order. They just don't take uh, the same vows and live under um, the prior in the same way or priors. And this is the Dominican shield here on the left. And the Latin is praise, bless, preach. Okay. Finally, Teresa of Avila. Teresa of Avila was a Carmelite nun and reformer of the order. She was a spiritual writer who was brilliant yet practical. She addresses those with souls and minds so scattered that they are like wild horses no one can stop. So this is tremendously edifying for somebody like me who struggles to pray silently, but even though Teresa is you know, supremely sophisticated in her mystical knowledge and writings, she's addressing people like myself who, you know, your mind's going all over the place. So eminently practical as well as, uh, you know, brilliant and mystical. And her writings include The Way of Perfection, The Interior Castle, and her autobiography. All right, let's look at some historical context for 16th century Spain. Teresa lived at a time in which her country had become the greatest power on earth. Spain held land all over the globe. While the Protestant Reformation was raging in Germany, France, Switzerland, England, and other parts of Central and Northern Europe, Spain was experiencing a golden age in church life, literature, and art. The Reconquista of Portugal and Spain was also nearing its end. Islamic forces had held parts of the Iberian Peninsula since the 700s, but the last Islamic state on the Iberian Peninsula, the Emirate of Granada, surrendered in 1492. Um, other people who were active in 16th century Spain, Ignatius of Loyola and the first Jesuits, St. John of the Cross, uh, Miguel Cervantes, who wrote um, Don Quixote, and the list goes on. So the point is that it was an incredible historical moment. Okay, here is, again, where Avila is, uh, kind of in, this, in the middle of Spain, a little bit west of Madrid. And it's a medieval town, it's, it's walled in, as you can see here, with those turrets kind of lining the, uh, dotting the wall. Teresa was one of 10 children. Her mother died when she was 12. And a few years later, her father sent her to be taught by Augustinian nuns. And it was at that school that she began to desire religious life. After reading the letters of St. Jerome, she decided that she must follow the call to enter religion but her father, strongly attached to his favorite daughter, was unwilling to allow her to leave. On November 2nd, 1535, she fled home and entered the Carmelite Monastery of the Incarnation in Avila itself. So when she was 20, she left home, fled to the, to the convent. And she was very happy there, but she deeply missed her father. So this is another thing that makes, um, you know, Catherine was relatable for one set of reasons, Teresa for others. She loved religious life, but she also really missed her father. So there, it was a both end that um, it wasn't like it was perfectly happy or that she was utterly miserable. It was, there was a tension there. And that's, I think, the most common way of experiencing um, major decisions in life like that, that involve great sacrifice. In 1538, she nearly died of illness and she was never the same physically, although she did experience a really significant healing, which she attributed to St. Joseph. Teresa was well-read. Um, she knew the classics of Catholic spirituality, and, and so she was firmly grounded in those texts. Now, notably for a mystic, this is, might be counterintuitive, that prayer did not always come easy, easily for her. So, in fact, there was a time when she gave it up entirely. It was a brief period, but she regarded this error as the worst of her life and recognized that it could have had dire consequences. So, the lesson we take from that is even when prayer is so difficult, never stop praying. She did persist in prayer and God rewarded her with mystical experiences. Um, and as a result of her efforts to describe these experiences and receive proper guidance, a group of people came to know her, were fascinated by her and her writings. These included theologians, teachers of spirituality, Dominicans, Jesuits, secular priests, 
laymen and women, and even the Bishop of Avila. After many extraordinary mystical experiences of rapture, locutions, and intellectual and imaginative visions, Teresa received her terrifying vision of hell. So Catherine saw hell, so did Teresa. The result of which was her determination to live the Carmelite rule with greater perfection, which in turn led to another mission, the founding of a new manner of contemplative life within the church. So Teresa had this uh, vision of hell, but she took positives from it and including this reformed way of uh, Carmelite life. And she founded 14 monasteries on this new model of hers. But let's talk briefly about Teresa's vision of hell. I'll read through this. <clears throat> I found myself, as I thought, plunged right into hell. I realized that it was the Lord's will that I should see the place where the devils had prepared for me there and which I had merited for my sins. This happened in the briefest space of time. But even if I were to live for many years, I believe it would be impossible for me to forget it. The entrance, I thought, resembled a very long, narrow passage, like a furnace, very low, dark, and closely confined. The ground seemed to be full of water, which looked like filthy, evil-smelling mud, and in it were many wicked-looking reptiles. At the end, there was a hollow place scooped out of a wall, like a cupboard, and it was here that I found myself in close confinement. But the sight of all of this was pleasant by comparison with what I felt there. My feelings, I think, could not possibly be exaggerated, nor can anyone understand them. I felt a fire within my soul, the nature of which I am utterly incapable of describing. I had been put in this place, which looked like a hole in the wall, and those very walls, so terrible to the sight, bore down upon me and completely stifled me. There was no light, and everything was in the blackest darkness. So as terrible as this was, Teresa was still grateful for the vision. You know, it strengthened her spiritually and it made her care deeply that other souls not end up there. Here is a, a, perhaps the most famous depiction of uh, a mystical experience by Teresa of Avila. This is the Ecstasy of St. Teresa by Bernini. This is held at uh, Santa Maria della Vittoria in Rome. And here, briefly, an excerpt from one of her major writings, The Interior Castle. She says that the soul is like a castle made entirely out of a diamond or a very clear crystal, in which there are many rooms, just as in heaven there are many dwelling places. Jesus tells us in the gospel that there are many dwelling places in heaven. So Teresa says there are seven dwelling places, and there's a division. There's the, uh, the first three of them are achievable through human efforts the, with the ordinary help of grace. And the remaining four deal with the passive or mystical elements of the spiritual life. So only God can carry us into the, the latter four. So it's a really sophisticated way of understanding the soul in relation to God and the act of prayer. Uh, this is contained in her work, The Interior Castle. Here's a painting showing Teresa. She's in the Carmelite habit here. So the Dominican habit that Catherine of Siena had on, it's black and white. The Carmelite habit is brown and white. And this is a depiction of a vision she had of the Holy Spirit. So we see the Holy Spirit depicted as a dove. And here's a, a different painting, but one that's very similar. The same vision, you can see the dove at the top of the screen. And there is Teresa kneeling in the Carmelite habit. And on that table there, in addition to the crucifix in the book, there's a skull. Saints are frequently depicted with skulls in the background or somewhere because they're reflecting on their mortality constantly. Um, they have their mind towards God. and it, eternal life with God rather than, uh, you know, focusing on the, um, the, what the world values. Okay. And lastly for Teresa, she was a Carmelite. There's the Carmelite seal. The Carmelites were founded late in the 12th century in Mount Carmel, Israel. Or, uh, and if you ever meet a Carmelite, you'll notice that after their name, there's O Carm, which is the Latin abbreviation for the order of Carmelites. They are contemplatives, so very different from the Dominicans. They are not active mendicants. They are contemplatives. They are, uh, you know, most at home in silent prayer. And it's uh, deserving of note that Teresa reformed the order of Carmelites and established 14 new monasteries on her model. Her model was a stricter interpretation of the rule than was being observed at that time. Okay, now on to conclusions. Okay. Simple definition of a saint, 
as we are looking at three saints here, someone whom the church has formally declared to be united with God in heaven, an intercessory to God on behalf of the living and worthy of public and universal veneration. Saints are Christ-centered, as we have seen with these three, and they guide us to Christ through their writings, example, and intercession. Most sources you will encounter about saints are hagiographical, hey, like at a bookstore. But remember, you can read Catherine and Teresa in their own words. So it's best, don't take my uh, you know, words for it when I'm describing them, read them in their own words. And they, both Catherine and Teresa are doctors of the church because through their research, study, and writing, they have advanced the church's knowledge of our faith. All right, remember how we examined each saint. We began with a quick overview, went through his, some, some historical and geographical context, then some additional biographical information before looking at an excerpt from the saint's writing and a quick look at the religious order with which she is affiliated. Here's a table just summarizing uh, the when and where, the when, where, who. So, you know, Macrina is the first column, then Catherine and then Teresa. Here's the map again. So again, you can, we can move from east to west. Mokrina in what is now northern Turkey, Catherine in what is now northern Italy, and Teresa in the center of Spain. All right, what I hope you remember from the talk. Mokrina from fourth century Asia Minor, co-founder of the Order of St. Basil the Great, profoundly influenced her mother, St. Amelia, and younger brothers, St. Basil and St. Gregory of Nyssa. Catherine, 14th century Italy, Dominican tertiary. In other words, she was a third order laywoman. She helped restore the papacy to Rome. And finally, Teresa, 15th century Spain, a Carmelite nun and reformer of the order, and a brilliant writer on spirituality. Regarding the excerpts from their writings, Macrina emphasizes the salvific implications of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection. Okay, so from Macrina's prayer, you know, she's uh, kind of sh showing to us how we can live with God forever due to the Paschal mystery, Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Catherine and Teresa reveal the unfathomable depth and intensity of God's love, as well as the reality of sin and hell. Okay, so those are simultaneous things. Macrina writes, you have opened the way of resurrection after breaking the gates of hell. Catherine says, God is mad with love for each one of us. And God said to Catherine, I loved you without being loved by you even before you existed. And Teresa, Teresa writes that Jesus's love is so strong that he never takes his eyes off of you. And Jesus means that for each one of us. Each saint is part of the legacy of her religious order. So Macrina with the Basilians, Catherine with the Dominicans, and Teresa with the Carmelites. All right, final words. Pray, pray, pray. Do anything you can to pray as much as you can. For help, draw from the Catholic mystical tradition. These saints, Macrina, Catherine, and Teresa, they can be your guides in prayer, and they will bring you to Christ.